welcome everybody to Lunatic Froggy. Today we're going to be talking about some hard things. We're going to be talking about John Wayne Gacy. We're going to talk about essay, mental, physical, and psychological abuse. We're going to talk about kind of how like mental, physical, and psychological torture raises people to be like this and we're gonna kind of briefly talk about narcissism now if you don't know what narcissism is it's basically somebody who believes they're constantly right and they can never do anything wrong and they constantly had a better life than you or a harder life it all depends on what you're talking about and they will use your discomfort for their enjoyment so let's get on to this so mr john wayne gacy was born March 17th, 1942. He was sick when he was a child. So, like, he wasn't able to go out and do things and run and play. So, he felt like he was captive in the house. What they don't, well, what they do tell you, but not many people really focus on this. If you're stuck in the house and your dad or mother is a narcissist and will belittle you make you feel like you're nothing and physically harm you it takes a toll on your mental health but what a lot of people don't realize is when john wayne gacy was like six years old his mom had a friend who had a teenage daughter that would come over in front of john and diddle herself she would do this for about four years and shortly after she did uh, he turned 11 another family friend would sa him continuously so from the ages of 6 to 12 he was being sa'd now does this give him any excuse no it does not but that paints a picture of what his childhood was like because not only was he getting essayed he was being berated he was being hit with a razor strap multiple times to the point he would have bruises all over he was sick he was trapped in the house he felt like a prisoner his father would constantly call him gay stupid you know things along those lines berate him and as his father's doing all this he's also getting essayed so he never really came out to his family about it because you know essay, being essayed was hard back in the old days and not only that he was a young child and nobody stood up for him um he had multiple surgeries from between the age of like six up um between the ages of 14 and 18 he spent almost a year in the hospital um which made him miss a lot of school. While he was laying in the hospital bed, his dad decided that he was faking it and outright screamed at him for faking it while in the hospital because they could never really figure out what was going on with him. He would have seizures and black out. It was just never a good thing. In 1960, at the age of 18, uh, he started working for a uh, Democrat party, which really kind of made his dad mad and would his dad would call him a patsy and put him down and then in the same year in 1960 his father bought him a car the issue with this is his dad would if he didn't do what his dad wanted his dad would take the car so his dad would hold it over his head until it was completely paid off well about four years after or two years after he got the car from his dad he left for Nevada with like 136 bucks to his name. Now remind me, back in that day, you could get a full tank of gas, a pack of cigarettes, and a Budweiser, or a 24 pack of Bud for like five bucks, okay? That's where nickel and dime bags actually played nickel and dime bags, because you could get them for a nickel and dime. Um, But his father continuously used this car over his head to the point where he took the distributor cap and held it like, prisoner for three days so, so he ended up moving to las vegas with his cousin and he worked as an ambulance service before transferring to the march to a mortuary where he worked with dead bodies um 
he worked with them absorbing embalming and occasionally was occasionally was a pallbearer uh he ended up sleeping on a cot in the right behind the embalming embalming room because he had no other place to go so once he left there he enrolled at northwestern business college uh he graduated in 1963 and took a management training position with a shoe company in 1964 the company transferred him to springfield illinois to work as a salesman and eventually promoted him to department manager during their courtship of work uh he ended up dating and mar uh getting engaged to marilyn myers uh during the courtship of his relationship with Mar marilyn myers gacy joined the local chapter of the jc's the same year he had his second homosexual experience according to um gacy a college a colleague piled him with drinks and invited him to spend the evening on his sofa and proceeded to do acts on gacy as he was drunk so he was essayed for the second like second time of by a male in 1965. Uh, by 1965, Gacy had risen to the position of vice president. He, now, Gacy and Myers, now remember, her real name is, or her name is Marilyn Myers. Gacy and Myers married in 1964. Who, and Myers' father owned KFC restaurants all throughout Iowa, so he became a management at one of these restaurants, and he would get fifteen thousand per year, which was is about the equivalent of one hundred and fifty three dollars or one hundred and fifty three thousand dollars nowadays. So he was making bank for that employment. Um, he had a son in nineteen sixty six and a daughter in nineteen sixty seven with his wife, who was not head over heels about it but it is what it is now he is like way up there in the jc chapters he's kind of like the ceo he's you know been up there he'd always bring chick uh come tucky fried chicken to the events because you know he got his daddy in law owned it so they would always call him the colonel in 1967 gacy essayed a 15-year-old by the name of Donald Voorhees Jr., the son of a local politician. Gacy would lure Voorhees Jr. to his house with the promise of showing him heterosexual stag films, basically porn. Regar regularly played it at J.C.'s events. Gacy piled Voorhees with alcohol. To the point where he was like, yeah, not all there. Um, and then he would engage in, well, they would get engaged in oral sex on both of them. Um, so that is the very start of where, like, he starts his victims as an adult. I will cl clarify. As an adult, he started essaying his victims in 1967 his first victim was donald borges jr um over the next following months gacy abused several other youths youths including one whom he encouraged to have sex with his own wife before blackmailing him into performing oral sex with him so basically he's like oh yeah you could go sleep with my wife you could go sleep with my wife and then he's like i got photos and video evidence that you slept with my wife now you can do me a favor so mr Voorhees jr decided that he was kind of up in ears with this and in march of 1968 uh Voorhees told his father about the essays and a lot of times Gacy wasn't stupid he would give them 50 bucks he paid them all 50 bucks just so that way he could be like oh yeah it was um scientific research or I paid him he was a prostitute so John Wayne Gacy ended up getting charged um 
and was demanded to take a polygraph test. And the results of these tests indicated of deception, which basically John Wayne Gacy lied. Uh, he public Gacy publicly denied any wrongdoing and insisted the charges were political mo uh, motivated, basically saying, I didn't do nothing. It's because we're running against each other. I did nothing. And then he was charged and convicted. On August 30, 30th, Gacy promised one of his employees, 18-year-old Russell, $300 if he physically assaulted Voorhees in the effort to discourage the boy from testifying. So then he ended up getting charged with uh, tampering with a uh, witness. But yeah, they beat Voorhees up pretty bad. But Voorhees escaped and reported it. He <laughs> he. Uh, on September 12th, Gacy was ordered to undergo a psychiatric evaluation, and two doctors concluded that he had antisocial personality disorder. So, yeah, based um the clinical term for so sociopathy and or psychopathy. So basically, he was. Back then, you got to remember that they didn't have, like, all of the information that they do nowadays. But basically, they found him as a psychopath. Um, which is true. He is kind of psycho. So, at that point in time, they should put him in a mental hospital and threw away the key. So, anyways, on November 7th, he ended up pleading guilty to counts of sodomy in retaliation relation to Voorhees. But not guilty on the charges related to the other use. He claimed Voorhees had offered himself to him and that he had acted out of curiosity the other ones he claimed that he there was nothing there but his wife left him with his children so his wife was like yeah no homie we're getting the fuck out of here you're not going to be doing this shit so shortly after he got out of imprisonment he ended up moving back to chicago um which he was granted parole with 12 months of probation so he only served 18 months of a 10-year sentence. Go figure. Um, in Chicago, on February 12, 1971, Gacy was charged with sexually essaying a teenage boy who claimed that he had lured him into his car at the Greyhound Terminal and dro drove him to his house where he attempted to force the boy into doing unspeakable acts. Um, he ended up fleeing and uh, filed a... Yeah, he basically was like, hey, he did this. So John Wayne Gacy was, um, like, released of that because the uh, court case was dismissed because the boy didn't appear. On June 22nd, Gacy was arrested and charged with uh, S aggravated essay and reckless conduct in response to a complaint filed by youth who claimed that Gacy had flashed a sheriff's badge, lured him into his car, and forced him to perform uh, oral on him. These charges were dropped after the complainant attempted to blackmail Gacy. The Iowa Bo Parole Board did not know none of these incidents because, again, they were all dropped. With financial assistance from his mother, Gacy bought a ranch-style home um, in Norwood Park Township, Illinois. Which, damn, get him away from there. So in 1971, Gacy decided he was going to try and get married. Um, married again. Uh, he he and his mother moved into the house that they bought in Illinois, and he he got engaged to Carol Hawk whom he'd been briefly date, dating in high school. Carol and her two youngest daughters from Gacy's previous marriage moved into the house soon after. They were married on July 1st, 1972. Gacy's mother moved out of the house shortly before the wedding. Thank goodness. By 1975, Gacy had told his wife that he was bisexual, which is like, not a big deal nowadays, but back in those days, that was a big thing. And there's still a lot of misunderstanding and uh, homophobia when guys come out as bisexual, which is really stupid. Um, he ended up uh, building his con uh, construction company, and by 1975, PDM was 
expanding rapidly and Gacy was working up to 16 hours a day. So basically he worked and slept. Go figure. But now PDM is where he would um, hire these teenage boys that were coming into play and he would do unspeakable acts to them. Um, the annual revenue was over $200,000 in 1978, which is a lot of money nowadays. Uh, throughout his membership of the local Moose Club, Gacy became aware of the Jolly Joker Clown Club, whose members regularly performed at fundraiser events and parades, in addition to voluntarily uh, entertaining children in the hospital, and Gacy decided that he wanted to join this club. So he became Pogo the Clown and Patches the Clown. Now, Pogo the Clown was happy-go-lucky and Patches was more serious. Um, he seldom earned money for doing this. He just had a fun time being a clown because he is a clown. And part of the reason is because he felt free being a clown and volunteering and being funny and all that stuff. So he ended up using a lot of the PDM workers to do things on him and this is how he managed that uh much of pdm's workforce was high school students and young men he really liked to go for the gold on that one now he would hire people that were easily manipulated and i'm gonna put it that way very nicely because think about it most young boys and teens are easily manipulated into doing things that they don't want to do just so that way they could get views or you know extra work or extra money so um in 1973 gacy and a teenage employee traveled to florida to view a property gacy had purchased while there gacy graped the employee in their hotel room after returning to chicago the employee drove to gacy's home and beat him in his front yard gacy told his wife he had been attacked for refusing to pay him for poor quality painting work um that was gacy's excuse even though he physically essayed a uh teenage employee in may 1975 gacy hired a 15 year old and two months after he hired him, he would again lure the young man into his house and they drank two bottles of wine. Then they watched some corn videos before Gacy wrestled with him on the floor and cuffed his hands behind his back. One cuff was loose enough that he was able to, uh, Anthony, which was the young boy, was able to free his arm while Gacy was out of the room. When Gacy returned, um, Anthony, who was a high school wrestler, um, uh, wrestled him and obtained the key and got the cuffs off and cuffed Gacy behind the back. Gacy threatened Anthony, then calmed down and promised to leave if he um, was freed. And he did leave and never made another um, attempt on Anthony. On July 26, 1967, Gacy picked up an 18-year-old hitchhiker and did the same thing. Um... But due to the fact that the hitchhiker kicked Gacy in the face and freed himself, uh, that was null and void, and he couldn't do that. A month later, Gacy appeared at Cram's bedroom door, intending to grape him, saying, Dave, you really don't know who I am. Maybe I, it would be good if you gave me what I want. Um, Cram resisted straddling Gacy, who left the bedroom, stating, you ain't no fun. Cram moved out on October 5th and left PDM, although he periodically worked for Gacy over the following two years. Shortly afterwards, another employee who was an 18-year-old, Michael, moved in, which, again, he would use, oh, you can move with, in with me. Um, he worked with PDMs since May 23rd, 1967. He lived with Gacy until April 1977. Um... Now, Rossi, which is, the, it's Michael Rossi, he would go around and help Gacy with um, clowning at open grand openings of businesses as Gacy was Pago and Rossi was Patches. Now, this is where Gacy got into the first homicide, okay? Um, McCoy, uh, so Timothy McCoy lived with gacy uh he picked him up at the greyhound bus station and 
McCoy got up to make Gacy breakfast. Now, Gacy claimed that when he woke up early in the morning, McCoy was standing in his bedroom doorway holding a knife. He jumped from his bed and McCoy raised both arms in a gesture of surrender, accidentally cutting Gacy's forearm. Gacy disarmed McCoy and banged his head against the bedroom wall, which should have been enough, and kicked him against the wardrobe. McCoy kicked Gacy in the stomach, doubling him over. Gacy then grabbed McCoy, wrestled him to the floor, and stabbed him repetitively in the chest with the kitchen knife. As McCoy lay dying, Gacy claimed he washed the kitchen knife in the bathroom, then went to the kitchen and saw that McCoy was making him breakfast, had made him breakfast, and was going to wake him up. He was just accidentally carrying a knife with him, and that's when all of that wrestling stuff happened. Um, but at this point in time, Gacy finally realized that he was a psycho, and he decided that killing was fun. Yes, you guys heard me right. Gacy thought killing people was fun. So let's get into John Wayne Gacy's second murder, which this victim has been unnamed for a while. But in January of 1974, um, the unknown victim was strangled and placed into Gacy's closet before the a burial, Gacy later stated that the body fluids leaked from the victim's mouth and nose, sta staining his carpet. So he Gacy started using rags and or his own, the victim's own underwear or a sock in the mouth to prevent such leakage. Now, his third murder was of John. On J July 31st, 1975, J John, an 18 year old PDM employee, and you're going to see a lot of 18 year old uh, PDM employees on this one disappeared but john's car was later found abandoned with his jacket and wallet inside and the keys in the ignition the day before his disturbance uh, disappearance john had confronted gacy over an outstanding back pay um john's father called gacy who claimed he was happy to help search for his son but was sorry uh john had run away one question by the police, gacy said john had and two friends had arrived at his house demanding an overdue pay pay by they but they had reached a compromise and all three had left over the following three years john's parents called the police more than 100 times urging them to investigate john wayne gacy even further gacy later admitted to encountering john exiting his car waving to attract his attention according to gacy john approached him stating i want to talk to you gacy invited john into his own car then back to his house where again he ended up uh, sitting on the kid's chest for a while before strangling, strangling, strangling him. He stowed later confessing to, um, he, he stowed the body in the, his garage before putting the body in the crawl space below the house. When his wife and stepdaughters returned home earlier than expected, Gacy buried John under the concrete floor of the step, uh, the tool room extension in his garage in an empty space where he intended to dig a drain tile. So basically, John's a sex son of a bitch. Go figure. Now, that is not the only victim. So, <laughs> in 1967, uh, John Wayne and Gacy got a divorce, of course. Um, because the neighbors noticed behavioral changes. And they noticed that he was keeping the attention of young boys around. Um, they would often hear muffled, high-pitched screaming, shouting, and crying throughout the years. In 1976, one month after his divorce was finalized, Gacy abducted and murdered 18-year-old Daryl. He was last seen alive on in Chicago on April 6, 1976. Gacy buried him under the dining room with cloth lodged in his throat. Again, he did this so that way they couldn't scream and also so that way fluids would not leak out of the orifices. On May 14th, 15-year-old Randall Raffet disappeared shortly after returning home from a dental appointment. Hours after Raffet was last seen by his family, 14-year-old Simon vanished as he walked home from his sister's apartment. On June 3rd, Gacy killed 17-year-old Michael Boney. 
Um, Gacy murdered 16-year-old William Carroll and buried him in, on, in the crawl basement. Um, July... Uh, so, Carroll seems to have been the first of the four victims known to have been murdered between June 13th and August 6th, 1976. Three were between 16 to 17 year old, and one unidentified victim appeared to have been an adult. So nine chances out of 10, they're talking 18 to 20 years old. On August 5th, 16 year old James was last known to have phoned his family, possibly from Gacy's home. Um, once again, they didn't have all the modern technology that we do nowadays. His body was buried in the crawl space between beneath 17 year old Rick Johnson, who was last seen alive on August 6th. Gacy is thought to have murdered two unidentified males between August and October 1967. On October 24th, Gacy abducted and killed teenager friend Kenneth Parker and Michael Marie Marino. The two were last seen on Clark Street in Chicago. Two days later, 19-year-old construction worker William disappeared after informing his family he was attending a party uh, Bundy died of suffocation. Gacy buried the body beneath his master bedroom. Bundy had apparently worked for Gacy. Between November and December of 1967, Gacy murdered 21-year-old Francis Alexander. His last contact to his fam with his family was a phone call to his mother sometime in November. He was not reported missing, as his family believed he had moved to California shortly thereafter, probably because Gacy told him that. Um, he was buried beneath the room Gacy used as his office. In December 1967, 17-year-old Gregory disappeared. His girlfriend last saw him outside her house. Gregory had worked for B PDM less than three weeks when he disappeared. He had informed his family that Gacy had him dig trenches for some kind of drain tiles in his crawl space. Gregory's car was later found abandoned. His parents and older sister contacted Gacy about Gregory. Gacy claimed that Gregory had expressed a wish to run away from home. He also claimed to have received an answering machine, machine message, say that five times fast, from Gregory shortly after he had disappeared. Of course, the message was not there. Huh? Okay, so... In 1977, John Wayne Gacy took John, who was, again, buried in the crawl space. He took another John, who was 20, Matthew Walter Bowman, July 5th, 1977. Robert Edward, who was taken on September 15th. 1977 jonathan anthony who was 19 on september 25th 1977 russell lloyd nelson uh who was took in on october 17th 1977 robert david witch winch who was only 16 who was taken on november 10th 1977 tommy joe Boiling, who was took in November 18th, 1977. They were both killed September 11th, 1977. David Paul and William Wayne were took in December 9th, 1977 and February 16th, 1978. Timothy David, who was took in in between July 16th to the 23rd of 1978. But this body was in Des Plain Plains River. Um, Frank William, who was discarded in Des Plains River in, uh, in November 14th, 1978. James Maza, who, again, was discarded in the river, but was taken on November 24th, 1978. And Robert Peast, who was taken December 11th. And the body was found in this Plains River. Now, John Wayne Gacy had a total of 33 bodies. Most of them was uh, buried in the crawl space. One was in the garage, one was in the right, 
uh, dining room, but a lot of them were buried in the crawl space underneath the house. Except for the last four bodies, probably because he had no more room. But, now let's talk about this crawl space. Cook County Medical Examiner, Robert, supervised the examination of the victim's bodies on in the crawl space. Um, each body was given an identification number. That's how many bodies were under there. The first body was recovered from the crawl space, was assigned a marker and then they just mark each like body so you gotta think there's a lot of bodies under there there was 30 29 bodies buried underneath this bo uh, crawl space and what he would do is every time that he would bury them he would add lye to keep it so the house wouldn't smell um which also helped with decomposition of the body now the victims that were found in the river, um, they were, like, 6 to 12 miles down the river from where he, like, um, dumped them. So, it was kind of hard to identify them as John Wayne Gacy's, but now there are five victims that nobody knows whose body they are. And one of those victims was actually buried in the backyard and not under the crawl space. So, th to those five that were never identified, it would be wonderful if they actually would be identified. Um, now, Gacy did have a couple more additional vic possible victims. Like, he, they can't determine if he did it or not did it. Um, there were only 33 victims linked to Gacy. But... When he was arrested and investigated, he claimed to the investigators that the total number of murder victims could be as high as 45. So either there's a lot more bodies underneath the crawl space or there's a lot more bodies that were already found or in the uh, river that, you know, they really didn't, couldn't link to them. And despite DNA and dental tests conducted between 2012 and 2016, the bodies, um, found in the common graves in Gacy's crawl space, there was, like, no hit markers on them. So, now, there was, okay, so, I want to get this correct, despite DNA and dental tests conducted between 2012 and 2016, indicated that neither body found in the common graves in Gacy's crawl space and identified as those of Kenneth Parker and Michael Marino in 1980 was actually Marino. Marino's mother has always doubted her son's identification because the clothing found on the bot on body 14 was inconsistent of what he had worn when she last saw him. DNA's testing concluded on the examined body of Parker has proven that Marino's body had not been mistaken for his hits. In addition, the dental x-ray conducted on the victim identified as Michael Moreno had revealed that he had all of his second molars and dental x-rays conducted on Moreno in March of 1976 revealed one molar had not erupted at that point in time. The original identification of the body has been disputed because of the exhumed body had neither an upper nor lower jawbone. Nevertheless, the orthodontist who had identified Marino's remains had stated in his conviction in the accuracy of his finding. So there is a little bit of dispute between the DNA and even though like the DNA says it's him and the dental says that it's him. The boy's mom is like, yeah, no, that's not him. On May 23rd, 1978, 25-year-old Charles was found drowned in the um pecan. Yeah, was found in a river near Freeport, Illinois. He had been missing since May 13th. Um, he was also an employee of PDM and had been linked to the initial investigation of Gacy after Michael uh informed investigators of both Gosick's disappearance and Hatala's death. Moreover, Razi has stated that Hatala was known to have conflict, conflicts with Gacy, and when he had failed to show up to work, Gacy had informed him and several other employees that he had drowned. At the time of Hatala's death, no bo more bodies could be stored in Gacy's crawl space, which leaves the possibility he had to dispose of the body in the river. However, um, 
this plane's authorities had contacted Freeport during their investigation into Casey and were told that he had fallen to his death from a bridge. Which, I mean, that ain't hard to do. I mean, this police officer is stupid. Um, retired Chicago police officer Bill stated he had reason to believe that there might be more victims buried in the grounds of the apartment building on West Miami Avenue in Chicago, where Gacy had been a caretaker for 70 years. Um, they observed Gacy holding a shovel early in the morning. When Dorsch confronted him, Gacy said he was doing work that he was too busy to do during the day. Uh, the cop also said that several other residents of West Miami Avenue stated that they had seen Gacy digging trenches at the property in the early to mid-1970s, so there may be more bodies buried there. Um, now, you would think, how is Gacy getting away with this? Some people believe that there was accomplices that um, helped Gacy get away with this. Um... In 1980, Gacy informed the FBI that two or three PDM employees had assisted in several several murders. Um, the FBI, Robert, we're going to call him Robert, believed there was unexplained avenues to the case and that Gacy had killed more than 33 victims in multiple states. Gacy neither conformed nor denied Robert's suspicions. Of course he did. He likes, he's, likes fucking with the police. Um, Jeffrey, who had been assaulted and tortured by Gacy in May, March of 1978, was admitted, or, well, yeah, was admitted that at one point during his ordeal, a young man with brown hair had watched his abuse and that he had saw a light come on elsewhere in the house. So, other people knew of what Gacy was doing and not one of them gave a rat's ass. So, Mr. John Wayne Gacy has formally passed away. Thank the great heavens. He is a serial killer. And I hope you all enjoyed this. And remember, just because they're a clown doesn't mean they're funny. I hope you have a great day. Love you all. Have a great day. Bye.